Okay, so I might jump in um, and share my screen um, and we can get into it. I, I don't want this to be too long and I don't want it to be boring or death by PowerPoint. So uh, the whole point of this session is to be informative for you. Um, I'm going to go through some slides and I'll share them with you afterwards as well. So uh, if there's detail on the slides that I don't go into, you have it uh, as a reference afterwards. But the key takeaways from this session uh, will be for you to understand everything you need to know about starting a company in Singapore. And then once you've got a company, everything you need to know about keeping that company compliant and just what you need to be aware of once you've registered a company in Singapore. Uh, so in terms of Singapore, um, we um, are helping on average every month between 100 to 200 companies to register in Singapore. Um, on average, each month, there's about 4,000 to 5,000 corporations of companies in Singapore every month, which is quite, quite a lot. Um, and the reason why everyone is coming to Singapore, as, as probably most of you know, is uh, there's very low tax. It's a very attractive system when you are a company founder and shareholder, because in Singapore, there's no tax on dividends. So if you pay yourself a dividend as a shareholder on your own company, there's no tax in Singapore. But the caveat or the key to this consideration is if you are a tax resident of another country, so say you are living in India or, or in Israel, that money is that coming back to you, then the Israeli or the Indian government will say, okay, where's this foreign sourced income coming from? And then they'll probably want to tax you. But if you're a Singapore tax resident and you pull money out of your own company as a dividend, there's no tax. The other benefit, uh, beneficial tax wise is there's no capital gains tax, which is why there's a lot of people who bring IP to Singapore and they sell their IP in Singapore. Uh, so there's no tax when you sell your company. Um, as a new business, you have access to some generous um, tax schemes, uh, which I'll, I'll go to on the next slide. But essentially, this is to encourage entrepreneurship and startups by having the first three financial years uh, having tax exem exemption on profit. Um, the next one is that Singapore has double taxation agreements with upwards of um, 80 different countries. And that is why lots of people set up a company in Singapore and do business internationally, because there's many clauses in these, these double taxation agreements, which allows you to flow money between different countries very effectively in a completely legal manner. Um, but companies structure them, their, their international operations very strategically so that they minimize their tax. Uh, and to, to give you an example of that, as I mentioned around the dividends, if you are a tax resident of Singapore, there's no tax on dividends. But if you are a tax resident of Indonesia, and you, the dividends tax rate in Indonesia is 20%. But the Singapore-Indonesian tax agreement says that if you pull dividends out of Singapore back to you in Indonesia, the tax rate is only 10%. So this is one example of uh, one clause of one tax agreement. There's many of these. So again, they can be really leveraged uh, to your advantage. The other benefit of Singapore is that they have a small company audit exemption. Uh, so that means that if you have a turnover of less than 10 million revenue uh, a year, you don't need to do an audit, which just in terms of a startup saves you cost, saves you time. Other countries like India or Hong Kong require you to do an annual audit, which again is another thing that you need to worry about. But Singapore for small companies, you don't need to. Uh, as you know, probably participating in this program, uh, Singapore is a great location for funding. Um, I attended a demo day before COVID hit where the guy next to me heard a pitch from someone um, doing an innovation in recycling. And afterwards he walked up and invested $100,000 in the company. And it was the first time he'd heard the pitch, but he was so blown away by the founding team, by their vision, by their problem solving and the solution. Um, and that, that just really reflects on, there is money in Singapore. There's a lot of VCs, there's a lot of angel investors, and there's a lot of people looking for returns on their cash. Um, and Singapore encourages this. So it's a great place to raise money. 100% uh, foreign ownership on companies is also allowed, which makes it a very attractive place for foreigners to set up companies because you don't have to give away 51% of your company to a local uh, resident, like in other countries such as Thailand or Dubai. Um, Singapore allows you to own your own company and to, um, to reap the, the work of your own labor. Uh, and then the last point there on the slide is that Singapore has quite straightforward regulations when it comes to IP, uh, work visas, uh, and then licensing if you're in a licensed industry and also opening a corporate bank account. Uh, and the bank account is something that during COVID was probably the only good news that the world saw in terms of uh, COVID was that Singapore banks realized no one could come to Singapore because all the borders are shut. And so now they're allowing companies to set up a corporate bank account online, which was unheard of. So all of our clients, they had to fly to Singapore for a 30 minute bank meeting previously, but now the banks are allowing you to do it online. 
So that, those are some reasons why Singapore, of course, there's many other reasons. Um, the trends we're seeing is people are coming here uh, in, the, in the thousands um, because other regions are being more impacted by COVID. Uh, everyone who's doing e-commerce is in this region because of the low tax. Um, there's many different drivers for this uh, change. In terms of the startup tax exemption scheme, so this is um, for the first three years, as I mentioned, if you qualify, the qualification criteria is in the top left. And the key one to look at is at least one shareholder is an individual holding at least 10% or more of the shares. If your Singapore company is set up and it's owned 100% by another company, so like a mother company, it's, it's considered a subsidiary and not a startup. So you would not qualify for the scheme. The other point there is it must be a tax resident of Singapore, meaning that the, the main decision making or the control of the company should be in Singapore. In, with COVID happening at the moment, again, people who are setting up companies, they can't travel to, to Singapore to do their annual general meeting, which would qualify you to be a tax resident if your AGM originates in Singapore. So for the next few years, what's, what they're allowing is you to hold a telephonic or a digital um, AGM, and you can specify on the minutes that your tax that your AGM happened in Singapore to qualify for this tax exemption scheme. But in the future, you should at least come to Singapore once or twice to make some decisions for the company to qualify for this. But you can see that the way that tax works in Singapore is it's tax on profit only, so not on revenue. And so the first $100,000 of this scheme says that you will have 75% exemption on your first $100,000 of profit. So that makes your effective tax rate, which you can see in the bottom left, 4.25%, which is extremely low for a corporate tax rate. The next $100,000 is 50% tax exempt. So you can see that the next $100,000 will be taxed at 8.5%. And then Singapore's corporate tax rate, which is capped at 17%, is the remainder of the tax. So again, you get these benefits for the first three years. And then after those three years, you get the partial tax exemptions, which are shown on the bottom right. Um, or you get those partial tax exemptions if you don't qualify for this scheme. So again, 17%, even as a tax rate globally, is, is quite low and, and quite attractive. And again, it's only on profits uh, on the company. The other place where Sleek has an office is Hong Kong. Um, we set up in Hong Kong because the tax is even better and a lot of our clients were looking to go there. The difference between Hong Kong and Singapore is Hong Kong is if you do not have any customers in Hong Kong, then you don't pay any profits tax. And again, it's based on profit which is why internationally most companies that are doing e-commerce, they set up in Hong Kong because most of their customers are all over the world. And so they're not actually paying any tax in Hong Kong. And this is again, the reason why Hong Kong wants to do an audit because they want to actually audit to see if you have any customers in Hong Kong and you're not paying any tax at all. Um, the, the way of setting up a company in Hong Kong is very similar to Singapore. The main difference, as I mentioned, is in Hong Kong, you need an audit, Singapore, you don't. And Hong Kong, you, you don't need to have a local director, whereas in Singapore, you do. And we'll get to the requirements for setting up a company in Singapore next. Um, if you are looking at any other countries or you're interested in any other um, uh, countries that are seen on the list or in the region, um, you're more than welcome to reach out. Um, we have lots of resources. And also, we have some good partners in those countries that are aligned to us in terms of just being simple, being transparent in pricing, um, and being efficient. So if you are looking at any other countries, I'm happy to, to share those contacts with you. If you help with your project. So on to the fun part. You've got a great idea. Uh, it might not be AI, but maybe you're looking at building a zip line from the Merline to, uh, to MBS, and you need to start selling tickets uh, to your customers. The different uh, legal entity or legal structure you choose for your business will impact on these four things, particularly, which is one, access to tax incentives or grants. Second is your personal liability as a, co as a founder or a director your ability to borrow money or attract investment, and the last is your future scalability. So the three main legal structures in Singapore that are set up every, every month is a sole proprietorship, a legal partnership, or a private limited company. The first two, um, I'll go through very quickly, are only available for Singapore citizens or permanent residents. And the key difference between the first two is that they are not separate from your, legal, from your own legal identity as a person. So the profits are taxed under your personal income tax, and the second thing is you are personally liable if something goes wrong. Whereas the third entity type is called a private limited company, which is very common to many other structures around the world. And the whole point of it is it limits your liability to the company. Uh, it's transferable, you can sell it, 100% uh, foreign ownership is possible. It's quite easy to set up and it's fast to shut down, uh, which is called a strike off. Um, 
So this is where sleep kind of comes in. So just like you, you all, you're, you're solving a problem. You've got a great idea. You're tapping into a, a niche. For us, our founders who were two entrepreneurs, they found that every time they went to set up a new company, it was overly complicated. It was a bad customer experience and there was no consistency, particularly in price. So you would go to one law firm and they would tell you it cost $10,000. You would go to another law firm, they said $4,000. And then this guy said $300. So it was a very convoluted process. And so what they decided to do was to set up a digital platform, which allowed uh, people to set up a company entirely online. And the premise of our model works because Singapore accepts, just like in Hong Kong with Jason, digital signatures for signing documents. Um, so this is not acceptable in every other country, but for Singapore, at least any document that you sign can be signed digitally and is considered a legally binding document. So with this, it allows people to set up a company from anywhere in the world in, in Singapore, and to do it in a way that's quite efficient. So you can have shareholders in New York, you can have someone in South Africa, in Israel, and they could all sign documents to set up the company and it can be done very fast. So in terms of what you require to, to set up the company, the first is that you need at least one owner of the business. So one shareholder, which as I shared earlier, can be 100% foreign, and it can also be either an individual, so you personally, or it could be a company, so a corporate shareholder. Uh, the second thing is you need at least $1 paid up capital to set up the company. And that capital can be in any currency. It doesn't have to be in Singapore dollars. It could be in US dollars. Uh, it's, it's up to you to decide. It's recommended when you do register or incorporate the company that you keep the capital quite low, so under $1,000. Because if in any case you can't open a bank account, then it makes it a lot, difficult, a lot more difficult to reduce the capital on a company with, say, a million dollars issued shares than if it's only a $1 paid up capital. So again, in our case, we, um, we encourage everyone to incorporate with $1. And then as soon as your company is incorporated, the bank account's open, you can issue more shares. Uh, and there's no cost from our side to do that. Uh, so again, it just ensures that the speed and the efficiency of the process. Um, the third thing in the middle there is a company secretary. So this was our core business when we first started out. And a company secretary is uh, a person who has gone and trained to be a company secretary, typically around a five-year course. And it is the person that will help you to speak to the government anytime you need to do any changes to your company in terms of the legality or the regulatory affairs, or when you do your annual filing or your um, annual return. So whenever you speak to the government, um, they also help we help, we help prepare um, things like share certificates, uh, changing directors, issuing shares. Um, so you would contact someone like us if you needed to make those changes. The fourth thing is you need a local resident director. So this is someone who is residing and living in Singapore, hence the resident part. And the way that that's proved is that they have like a proof of local resident address, like a bank statement. Um, and the second thing is they must be a citizen or a permanent resident at the time of the incorporation. If you are a foreigner and you wanted to become your own local resident director and move to Singapore, you can apply for a visa the only visa that you can apply for that will allow you to be the resident director from the day one is called an entrepass, uh, and that's an entrepreneur visa. So you can get that visa before you have a company, or you, you can get the company and then add yourself later on if you get the entrepass. And the other visa is called an employment pass. And the employment pass is a sponsored visa by a company. So you can't actually be listed on the company with an employment pass until the company has first been set up, and then you can apply for the employment pass under the company. And that visa would allow you to come and live and work in Singapore. Um, and the, for, to, to get that visa, it's all based on finances. So you would need to pay yourself a monthly salary of at least 7,000 Singapore dollars or more. And for a new company, you would need to put into the company bank account at least 80 to $100,000, which is about 12 months of your, your monthly salary to prove that this company is a legitimate company and you actually have the resources to pay yourself. And you're not just getting a company to get a visa to come and live in Singapore because you want to go to Sentosa. So they're very um, particular on, on making sure the businesses that are being set up are actually legitimate businesses when foreigners are involved. Um, and the last uh, point there for a company is you need to have a registered address in Singapore. Um, so that's, that's kind of the five there. So in terms of other considerations, and this is the last slide for um, the first section, and then I'll, I'll opening up to, to questions or clarification because it's a lot of information. But the key thing is to, 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 to consider when you are setting up your company, um, ACRA, which is the company regulator, has a database of company names that you can choose. 
Some words on company names are restricted, such as the word Singapore, if you want to put Singapore in your company name, because obviously the government wants to ensure that whatever you're calling your company and doing is not going to bring bad reputation to Singapore. Other things such as architect or um, travel agent, things that require a license, they, they will refer you to uh, an authority in Singapore to get approval before they give you the access to that name. We had one client that was trying to register a company called Board of Architects, and he was not an architect. So again, it was a little bit misleading. So they declined that application for him. Um, but if you do get declined or your name's not available, you can just choose a different name. And the difference um, between, between maybe Australia, where I'm from, and Singapore is in Australia, you have to you have to register different business names if you want to trade under a different name. But in Singapore, you register your company name with ACRA, which is your official name. And then you can actually trade under different names or brands. Uh, as long as you put your business number, which is called a UEN, on your invoices, your website, so that people can trace back to see who you are. So, for example, we are registered as Sleek Tech, but we never call ourselves Sleek Tech Private Limited. We just call ourselves Sleek. Um, so again, you have that, that flexibility if your desired name is, is, is taken. The second point there is that every company in Singapore needs to have a business activity associated with it. And this is something that you choose at the time of registering the company. It's called an SSIC code. And again, it's used particularly for the government just for statistics purposes. Um, but some of the codes that you choose, they will require the need for a license before you are allowed to conduct that activity. So as I mentioned, like travel agents, architects, anything to do with funds management. Um, but most of the codes, they don't require a license. It's just, again, statistics for the government to know how many people are growing mushrooms, how many people are dentists. It's very, they're very specific. It's, it's, it's quite funny. Um, the third point is um, which end of financial year should you choose? Um, so in Singapore, you can choose your end of financial year rather than like most countries where they say, no, your financial year will start on January and it'll end in December. Or in Australia, it's June to July. Um, so Singapore, they allow you to choose. And again, it's strategic to choose because of those tax exemption on profit for the first three financial years. So most of the time when our new clients are registering, so say this month in February, the end of financial year, or now we're in March, the end of financial year would be in April next year. So it's exactly one full financial year. And then they would always continue with that as their financial year end. Um, do you need any license or permits? As I, as I explained, if you're importing or exporting, if you're doing anything that's regulated, you'll need to apply for a license. Where will you open your corporate bank account? So once you have a company, obviously you want a bank to get some money or investment. So as I mentioned, banks are allowing you to open those accounts online. Um, I'll share on that. Where will you work from? Um, so again, I guess we're all working from home for now, uh, but there's co-working spaces, there's different uh, locations. What insurances might you need? So corporate insurances, um, any, any insurance for your industry. So Sleek, we are also for Singapore a registered insurance agent and we assist lots of our clients for just understanding what insurances they might consider. And the last point there is what legal agreements may you need? And the most common legal agreements that we see our clients use are things such as shareholders agreements, ESOPs, um, so employee share option plans to attract really clever and smart employees that you might not have enough money to pay but you give them a promise through an ESOP of shares in your company. Uh, and typically you put in like a cliff. So they have to stay with your company for at least one year before their shares start to vest and then they get to own your business. Um, so again, I've seen everything from people giving away all of their company to employees, to, to investors. And then in the end, they only own a small percentage of their company and they're doing all the hard work. So things such as legal agreements are good to think about, particularly if you're a co-founders. Because at the beginning, it's, it's a honeymoon period, but things can go sour when money is involved and hard decisions are made. So it's good to, to kind of sit down at the beginning, put together a founder's agreement or a subscription agreement or these types of agreements um, to, to specify what will happen in the future. Um, good. So that's, that's kind of part one. Does anyone want to jump in with questions or clarifications or um, based off some of that content? Yes, Daniel, it's Ken Lang here. Um, yeah. We have a specific company that holds all the IP for mm -hmm. um, the analytics. And it was set up so as the analytics can do any business, retail, health, sport, whatever you want to do. So yep. it was set up so we could um, carve off specific markets for the IP. Mm -hmm. So we, I'm not asking for tax advice, but we would see that given that it's an IP company, it's mm -hmm. trading in the IP rather than selling it as a capital gain. So, so 
in Singapore, you were saying that the profits from selling the IP would be just the standard company rate of 6%. Yeah, so it, it, as I said, as you mentioned, it depends on how you've been using it or when you make the sale, uh, how that would how that would be considered as capital gains or not, uh, or whether it's being considered as profit. Um, if, if you do need a good tax um, advice uh, person, then I can share with you the person that lots of our clients use um, if you wanted to have that conversation. Mm. Um, I'll, I'll flick you her, her details after this and, and you can reach out to her in, in terms of that. Thanks, I'm, I'm not a, a tax agent myself, so I don't oh, want no, to it wasn't. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't asking for that. It's just the if IP is your trading, if, if it's your trading stock, yeah, then uh, you know, then you're not selling the IP specifically for capital mm. gain. So anyway, so that was my question. So the other question I had was, so what are the disadvantages of incorporating in Singapore? Yeah, so again, like Singapore's one destination that's popular, but there are other markets. Um, so in terms of what we see in terms of disadvantages, um, like just today, there was an announcement from the Ministry of Manpower, which is the, the Singapore kind of immigration department announcing that uh, spouses of foreigners who are in Singapore on an EP cannot get a work visa. They cannot get this thing called a letter of consent to work under a company. So this is a huge change because there'll be tens of thousands of people in Singapore that are foreigners that are on this, this LOC visa. So what we're seeing, like many other countries, is there's a, there's a tightening or there's a restriction on foreign workers in the country. Uh, and so if you do set up a company and you're looking to bring foreigners into the country, it is getting more and more difficult. So that's probably one disadvantage. But I guess that's a global issue. I think every country is making it very difficult because they're trying to prioritise local, local stuff. Um, in terms of other disadvantages, uh, I guess it depends on where your main business will be conducted. Um, Singapore is quite strategic because it's in the middle of Asia. Uh, there's many different countries which are familiar with Singapore. Um, and so we see it as more of a strategic position. Um, but again, you have to look at, again, those double taxation agreements. If you are doing business across different countries, maybe there's not. I don't think the US has one with Singapore. So again, if you have a US entity and a Singapore entity, there'll be no tax benefit between those two countries. But somewhere like Australia and Singapore, there's a double taxation agreement. And there's also a new uh, digital economy agreement, which was signed uh, last year by Scott Morrison, which is the first type of agreement in the world. Uh, and that's gonna be very pivotal for things such as AI or data or, um, uh, so that, that's something that's being leveraged by companies from Australia and Singapore at the moment. Yeah, I don't see we'd have an issue with um, employees in that the plan would be to employ locals anyway, but if yep. we brought people in, they'd be at the director level, which I'm assuming would be okay. Yeah, well, as I said, you just need to satisfy the EP criteria for a director level. Um, and then um, it's, Singapore's a place where if you have money, you can stay. If you don't, then it's quite hard to stay. So, because again, yeah. they, they, they get the income tax if you're here paying yourself a large salary. So, right. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank cool. you. Any, any, no, you're welcome. Any other questions or? Um, question um, from Jason. Yeah. yeah, Jason. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, question from Jason. Um, I'm wondering um, the bank account opening procedure in Singapore mm -hmm. because uh, due to the anti-money washing uh, measures, um, it is very difficult to open a bank in Hong Kong. I'm not sure how long it takes in Singapore and what is the uh, typical procedure for the document screening. Yeah, well, um, I'll, I'll jump to that maybe um, in the next next step. So I'll show you that. Hong Kong, because we have an office there, we know it's extremely difficult. Uh, so what we do for all of our clients in Hong Kong is they either set up a, a bank account in Singapore um, or we set up bank accounts through the virtual corporate account providers like World First or TransferWise, uh, which, again, are a lot easier than, say, HSBC or other uh, local banks in, in Hong Kong. So these type of provide, there's ones like NEAT or Currency. You can get a corporate account for your business that's linked to your company. And the process is again done online and it's a lot quicker than the local bank. I think with like HSBC, you need to show like $60,000 on the company before they'll even talk to you about opening a bank. And it could take six months to get a bank account. Um, in Singapore, even the local banks here, as, long as, as soon as they get all of the documents signed, um, so a bank like UOB can open a bank account within 14 days. So it's, it's a lot faster. A lot faster. Um, and just, just on that, so Sleek is actually now, we've got a license from the Monetary Authority of Singapore to actually become a bank ourselves. 
So we are now setting up companies for our clients and we're also immediately opening bank accounts for companies uh, who need to get payments quickly or need to, to have a, a bank for different reasons. Um, all right, cool. Was, that, was there another question there? I heard someone before asking. No, it was about this, also the same question about the bank account. I mean, uh, that, that's one of the many issues in every country that you want to work uh, with. So uh, how long is tech and how, what is needed from our side? Because I guess it's not only, I don't know if you, you are offering a legal services, but I guess that they will need some legal services involved in that and, uh, and other stuff. So it's, it's important to understand, I mean, what's, what's the, uh, the, the whole procedure of doing yeah. that. That's true. And also, um, I think, again, Singapore, with, with the regulations they have, there are certain nationalities which they do extra KYC on. And I think Israel is one of them. So just to be aware of that, um, when you go to some, some banks, they have less questions, less KYC. Others, they, they, they're a bit stricter. Um, so we did have one client that was rejected a bank account recently because they said one of the shareholders was Israeli. Um, so again, it, it's sometimes silly things like this um, in terms of yeah. their regulation. And Singapore is a black and white kind of place, as I said. They, they, they're very, not so much around bending rules or flexible. It's really like if it's written, then that's the rule. And it's uh, sometimes a bit frustrating with customer service, but in terms of other aspects of life also. Um, good. A any other questions or I'll jump on to the next section for us. Cool. All right. So um, just to recap on, on that section. So the whole process to set up a bank account, uh, sorry, the company can be done online. It can be set up within three working days uh, and everything uh, in terms of the KYC, the signatures, everything will be done online. And I'll show you at the end a very quick demonstration of, of how, that, how that happens practically. Um, so the second section is once you have a company registered, uh, just like every other country around the world, the companies must adhere to Singapore law. Uh, and the two key bodies uh, that you need to be aware of is APRA, which is the company regulator, which regulates all the companies in Singapore, and IRIS, which is the tax office. And uh, failure to meet these requirements, just like every other country, will lead to fines and penalties. Um, but the key thing to know as a founder or the director of your company is that everything is triggered by the end of the financial year of your company. So again, back to the point where it's not always the same for every company. So the only thing you really need need to remember is what is your end of financial year. Uh, in terms of some advice from our clients and from what we see, um, particularly for startups, it's really important for you to keep proper business records from day one because as soon as you go in to ask for investment or you ask for a bank loan, the first thing they, they ask is, okay, show us your financials to know that we are going to get our money back. And so if you haven't kept good financials, which a lot of startups don't do, it's, it's a real pain for you and a headache. So even if you use an Excel spreadsheet, uh, just get into the habit of keeping good records. Um, the second point there is, as I mentioned, uh, it's, it's, it is simple back to the tax in Singapore, but again, you don't need to be an expert on it because most people work with a, an accountant um, and most of our clients with startups, they take us to do that and just to support them. But in the end, you as the director and the shareholder will still be primarily responsible for the company. So it's good for you just to have the basic understandings of what, what are the key rules. Um, software like Xero, which is an, a cloud accounting software, or there's others, just make life so much easier. Zero is kind of like the market dominant player in Singapore. It integrates into all the banks. So your bank transactions can be automatically reconciled, uh, has lots of integrations into different platforms. Uh, and we are a platinum partner. So we have more than 2000 clients using Zero, uh, And we pay for Zero for all of our clients just to keep everything digital. Um, and Zero allows you to invoice, to do lots of different things and to see all your, your graphics in terms of your cash flow and balance sheet. Um, and the last point, just in terms of the taxes, leverage the, the tax system. Um, so Cora, who I'll share with Ken, uh, is our local tax contact. Uh, she's supporting a lot of our clients and doing structuring between India and Singapore and Malaysia. And there's a lot of um, subsidiaries that are owned by holding companies in Singapore. So it's, it's, you can strategically leverage that. But for us, our focus is just on the Singapore or the Hong Kong tax compliance. We don't get into like the nitty gritty uh, tax, uh, international tax. So this here is to just visualize for you exactly what you need to be aware of for a company. It's good to see it uh, because it can be a little bit confusing. So essentially, if we incorporated the company in January 2020, uh, our end of financial year, if we kept it to be 12 months, would be December 31st. During your financial year, you're just powering along, you're getting lots of clients, you're sending invoices, you're taking people out for beer and coffee and keeping those expense receipts and sending them to your accountant. And then at the end of your financial year, 31st of December, Three months after that is when you need to prepare your first tax uh, report, which is called your ECI or your estimated chargeable income. 
So you're estimating what income you had during your year of assessment in the previous year, so 2020. Three months after that, you then have to hold your annual general meeting where all the shareholders come together and talk about all the profit you made and decide whether you're paying dividends. And at that annual general meeting, you have to have prepared your financial statements. So the financial statements are made up from the base of your ECI. If you are a holding company in Singapore, which means that you have a company here that's controlling other entities, so the decision-making is impacting all of the subsidiaries, it's not compulsory, but it's highly recommended that you do a consolidation at the Singapore level if the holding company is in Singapore. And what that just means is that the companies in the other countries or even in Singapore, if you have a subsidiary, they close off their accounts when it comes to their assets and liabilities. And then at the group level, you consolidate it all together so that you're you're doing it um, in one clean kind of uh, balance sheet. Uh, and so again, if you don't have a holding company structure, you don't need to do a consolidation. After the AGM, once the, once the, the directors and the shareholders are met together, one month after you file your annual return to ACRA, which is the company regulator. So you can see the top of the line is IRIS, this is all the tax, and the bottom of the line is ACRA, which is the company regulator. And in your annual return, you have to submit your signed financial statements, which were presented to the shareholders at the AGM. And the last thing there on the bottom right is the XBRL, which is a, an additional report you need to do if you have at least one corporate shareholder. But if all of your shareholders are just individuals that are owning the shares in their own names, you don't need to do an XBRL. Um, and then the, the last thing up there is your corporate tax return, which is done Again, for that previous financial year, so 31st of December, that whole year, um, which is why it's a bit confusing because 12 months happened and then almost a year later, you're, you're finally doing your tax return for that financial year. Um, so in terms of, um, of sleep, how we support our clients, we do it based on a financial year. So if you take us during the dates January to December 2020, our coverage in terms of the accounting or the bookkeeping where we look at all your records and clean them up would be from the first day of January to the end of December. But included in that, we would also do all of the tax and the preparations you see there in the future. Um, and so even if you left us, if you're not, if you're not using us for from say 1st of January, 2021, we would still be responsible to do all of this tax in the future for you for the year that we were responsible for you. Um, so if, if you miss those deadlines, uh, which lots of startups do because they're so busy getting uh, lots of clients and hustling and distracted and no one really wants to talk about tax. Um, what happens if you miss them is for, if you miss your AGM deadline, so say your financial statements were never prepared, you never did your, you can't hold your AGM until your financial statements are ready, then you get a $300 fine. If you then miss your annual return deadline, you get another $300 fine. And if you present your financial statements later than six months, from your AGM, then you get another $300 fine. So the total fine you can get for um, each financial year, if you never do anything, is $900. Um, there is an opportunity to apply for an extension of time, which gives you an extra 60 days when you realize you're late. Uh, that costs $200. But the key thing is if you pay for that extension of time and you don't ever do it within the 60 days, then you, and then you're late, you still have to pay the $300. So in the end, you just need to get um, on top of your accounts uh, and, and see which one would be the better option for you. Um, I won't go too much into details, but the key thing is also keeping proper business records. Um, we see a lot of startups trying to claim things that are not tax deductible, um, such as personal expenses. Um, in Singapore for like uh, motor vehicles, it's quite easy to know if it's a personal or a, a not, uh, like a business because the number plates are different. So if you have an S number plate, then you can claim. And if you don't, then you can't claim. Um, so in terms of the corporate secretary role, as I mentioned, this is any time that you need to make changes to your company. So things such as uh, changing directors, uh, our package includes um, filing of your annual return. Uh, there's a $60 fee, which the government charges, which we absorb, so we don't charge that onto you. Uh, and so our pricing for the corporate secretary support is based on how many shareholders your company has. So if you only have one shareholder, then the whole cost for the entire year is $300. And if you say has started with one shareholder and then six months into the, the contract, you added a second shareholder, then we would do a pro rata from six months to the end of the contract at the price of two shareholders, which is 420. And, and the way that you would request anything from us in terms of um, changes to the company is through our platform. You would log in and say request. We show you there exactly what's the steps will be involved. We show if there's a cost and we give you an estimated time frame to, to make the change on your company. So again, 
If you have a new director you're adding and he's in a hurry, you can at least let him know that it'll probably take around four to five working days. And one of the key steps would be he would need to sign a consent to act as the new director. And we would need to then file that with the regulator to update your company records on, on the government. So I'll share this with you afterwards. This goes into more detail on what is in, what's included in all of those different statements. I, I, don't, I don't wanna go into it because it's super boring, um, but at least for you to have as a reference. Um, as I mentioned, our tax and accounting plans, they include all of the stuff you saw on that graph and the price, how they're priced is that it's based on your, your average monthly expenses every month. So it's very easy for you as a startup or our clients to, to estimate how much expenses they're gonna have on a monthly basis because expenses are things like salary, like marketing costs, um, and it's done as an average over the, the financial year. So we look at it every month or every quarter because we have an API with zero. And then at the end of the financial year, if you paid us for a plan that's lower, or you've had more expenses, then we do a, a debit. But if you paid us for a higher plan and it's been lower, then over the average, we give you a credit. So it's a very transparent system. It's not based on say, accounting transactions or something which is hard to predict. It's, it's a very fair system. And in terms of our pricing, we are a very, uh, very affordable in terms of the, the price. And then on the right-hand side, you can see that if you prefer to do your own accounting and bookkeeping, then you can take us for just the ad hoc tax. Um, but in terms of the value for money, it, it, it just takes makes a lot more sense to take the plan because we take care of the accounting, we give you the software, we do all of the, the tax, and all you need to do is focus back on your business. Um, so Jason, this is to, to jump in on the bank account um, and Jan for um, the process. So once you have your company registered with us, in the platform, you can say, I would like to open a bank account. You then pick on the right-hand side, you see the first step is to pick which bank you would like to open an account with. And then through our platform, because we collect from you all of the KYC already for the directors and shareholders, because we, we need to do that to onboard you. And we also prepare the business profile and the constitution. You can send that directly to our banking partners so that they have that and they can do a pre-assessment. If, um, if they, they, you pass the pre-assessment, what they'll do is they'll send you a questionnaire to ask you some questions about the business, who will be your main customers, where were you doing business? And then they will do a video call with you. So OCBC and UOB do a, a video call over Microsoft Teams. You as the director hold up your passport, say, this is me. Uh, they might get you to print out physical documents and sign it and then send it back to them by post. And then as soon as they receive those documents, the processing time, at least for OCBC is around 14 working days. Um, the other ones at the bottom there, World First Transfer Wise, again, they don't need you to come to Singapore. You can do them online. The main difference between the top, which is the traditional banks, and the bottom is that the top have a minimum deposit to open an account. So OCBC is 3,000, UOB is 1,000, and DBS is 50 to 100,000. Uh, and then the bottom ones, they don't have a minimum deposit, but they just charge a transaction fee every time you transfer money. So a little bit of a different model. Um, and the people that need to be present in that call to open the bank account, is at least one director who can make decisions and uh, whoever will be the signatory. And so in our case, for people that don't have a local director for their company in Singapore, we provide a, a nominee director service, which is one of my colleagues who's Singapore citizen or PR, who provides their ID just for you to have the company. And they can help you to provide their details to the bank, but they would not be added as a signatory. But you as the executive director, even if you're overseas, can be the one that's opening the, the, the bank account for the company. Um, in terms of other benefits for, for Sleek, so we have more than about 4,000 clients. Uh, we, as I said, we onboard about 200 clients every month. And so we can negotiate with big companies. Um, this is just a screenshot and it says it's a lot more than, than shown here, but deals for startups. So for example, Stripe, which I'm sure you guys know is a payment processing platform. Um, so if you're collecting payments by credit card, uh, they give all of our clients $10,000 free processing credits which is $10,000 of Stripe's 3.4% fee. So for your first year, that's it's quite a big saving as a startup if you're collecting a lot of payments. Um, other stuff there is Google, um, so they, like, in terms of their, their G Suite, um, and you can have a look um, uh, on our website under partnerships in terms of the others. Um, so just to finish off, so all of um, information, um, short resources are all available for free on our website, I'm sure. If you have any questions, they've been asked a million times before um, with 200 clients a week, uh, a month. So what we've done is we tried to capture the key takeaways to answer these questions on our resource page. And it's like a two, three minute read per topic, uh, which is perfect for startups because no one wants to read a long white paper anymore. Um, the, other, the other benefit of, of Speak is that we've built our own digital signature um, because again, that whole business model is based on signing documents. 
And during COVID, we released it for free for anyone to use. And so even if you're not a sleep client, you can use this digital signature. But if you are a client, then again, you have this to use to sign for documents, contracts, or anything for your clients. It's kind of like HelloSign or PandaDoc, but we've just built different features to make it a bit more user-friendly. Um, so to finish off, I might just jump uh, over to the, um, the, the present the platform. Um, but does anyone have any questions just on, on that second section on, on setting up taxes, compliance, bank accounts? Okay, cool. If you do, um, feel free to, to write it in the chat or just unmute yourself. Um, so essentially, I'll show you very quickly the client journey. Um, you can access our platform for free. There's no, nothing's charged unless you ever take any services from us. So essentially on our website, slick.com, you at the top here, you would just click register uh, and you would register an account to access our platform. The platform then shows you the portal with your user account. Daniel? Yeah. yeah. I think you're, uh, you're, I'm still seeing your presentation. I don't know if you are trying to show the website. Uh, apologies, yes. Let's see. New share. How's that? Better. Okay, great. So as I mentioned on the website, um, we have at the top here register. Um, you can see again, all the pricing on the pricing page and see the sliders for the shareholders and everything. But for the first time, if you wanted to see the platform or to find out the onboarding, you would just click register, create an account. Uh, once you register an account, you will see this, which is becomes a virtual version of your Singapore company. So again, this is Tim's account. Uh, you can have multiple companies under your one user account. Uh, and the process would be either you're starting a company, you have an existing company in Singapore and you wanted to do it more digitally. Uh, and then this is also the digital signature I mentioned, which you, you're free to use. But to start a new company, you would click here. Uh, you can check the company name to see whether it's available with ACRA, the company regulator. The next thing is you would choose your company activity code that you would register. So as I mentioned, there's thousands of these codes. The top five, there are the most common ones most of our clients choose. So like management consulting or development of software. Um, you describe the business activity. Uh, this is just for our compliance team. So this company, just kind of like all the pictures you gave earlier, will be engaged in AI. Um, has to be 100 characters, so I'll get past. Why are you interested in incorporating in Singapore? Where is the funds coming from to set up the company? where will the majority of your transactions be taking place? So again, these are just your classic KYC questions. Uh, and then the platform's designed like you're shopping on Amazon. So again, the requirement is you need a local registered address. Uh, if you have your own, you use your own. If not, then you can use our office in the CBD. It's 300 Singapore dollars for the year and it includes the digital mailroom whereby our team will receive all of the company documentation. We scan it, we upload it and get notified and at least it keeps it all in one place. And then the next step is you tell us who will be the directors and who will be the shareholders on the company. So if you do have a local resident director who's Singapore or Singapore citizen or PR, you can add them. Otherwise, if you're going to be overseas, you're not going to be in Singapore. You can use our nominee director. Uh, we offer it for one year, six months or three months. Uh, the three months or six months would only be if you're maybe using us temporarily until you get a visa or you're hiring someone to take over. Otherwise, you just keep it one year. And with the director, because there is risk in being a director, even if it's not executive, uh, we have a condition that you either provide a deposit, which we give back to you if you're no longer act as your director, or you take one of the accounting plans because that just allows us to ensure that the company stays compliant. Um, you then, if you're adding us, you then add in the other directors. So again, you could add yourself if this is your account and you can have as many directors as you like. There's no restriction. Um, and it doesn't impact on the price. Uh, and then the shareholders down here, as I mentioned, you can have an individual or you can have a company owning your Singapore business. Uh, and then the cost for the, the shareholders, the number of shareholders dictates the cost of the corporate secretary package. So if we just added one, um, agreeing with the terms of the conditions of the director, um, the accounting and tax, if you've chosen that with the director, um, again, it includes the bookkeeper, the software, the financial statements, the ECI, the tax return, everything. And the pricing is based on your average expenses. So for a new company, typically for the first three months of the first quarter, you won't have many expenses unless you're getting started straight away. So you can choose the lowest plan. And then if you increase the expenses later on, then we would just do an update for the other plan. And again, I don't have any corporate shareholders, so I don't need to add the XBRL. 
And that then shows you there at the checkout your estimated cost for the business. So incorporation is a one-off cost. $300 goes to the government to buy your company name, your company, and the other um, $15 goes to buy uh, your company name. So our fee for incorporation to help you register is $35, and we use that to prepare the constitution, the share certificates, and the resolution to open the bank. The corporate secretary is based on the number of shareholders, the address, the director, and the accounting and tax. So this would be your estimated cost for the first year. Second year, you would not have the incorporation, and the only changes in the cost would be if you added more shareholders or you had more expenses for the company. Um, so again, you can see that you can do that quite quickly if you have all the information. As soon as you pay by either bank transfer or credit card, um, invitations will be sent to the directors and shareholders to upload a copy of their KYC. Uh, which is a proof of ID, like a passport copy, and a proof of residential address valid within the last three months. Once those have been provided, we would then send out to everyone the documents to sign for the company, and then once everything's signed, we can register the business. Um, so that's, I think that's, that's enough for now. I think uh, a lot of information. Um, but does anyone have any final questions in terms of... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then, yeah I, I'd like to know whether, if we, for example, establish such a company, with one ownership, which is the current uh, the, uh, company, let's say, in Israel, and mm -hmm. we now uh, establish a subsidiary in, in uh, Singapore, then mm -hmm. when we decide to add one more director, will he be uh, substituted to further taxes just because he joined, or, or it doesn't work like that? Well, sorry, in terms of the taxes, will he be... Will the new, yeah, will the new director be uh, subject to, to taxes just because he got shares? So you would, only, you would only pay personal tax if he brings money out of the company. And so as a director, you can get paid a director's fee or a salary. If that director is living outside of Singapore, then Singapore charges a 22% withholding tax in Singapore. And then, as I mentioned, if you're bringing the money back to Israel, then they would say that's foreign sourced income, so Israel might tax you. But as a shareholder, you would only be taxed if you pulled the dividends out of the company. Um, but there's no requirement to pay directors either. Um, we just have a fee because it's a professional service, but we have a lot of companies in Singapore that have directors that are just friends of friends. Or um, So it's only, again, if, if you um, are receiving some form of payment and it depends on your tax residency where you're based, that would implicate the tax. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes, um, a question from uh, Jason. Um, mm -hmm. uh, from the business point of view, um, we do uh, the R&D. We spend all the money for development in uh, Hong Kong, not in Singapore. Mm -hmm. And then the revenue uh, of sales revenue is at Singapore. Then in this case, uh, almost everything is perfect. Then and we need to pay for the tax in Singapore. Correct. Right? And Correct. yeah, so, and then um, when we receive the money from Singapore to Hong Kong, we pay it, we pay tax again. So um, I'm thinking, I'm wondering, oh, whether there's any other way to avoid such, uh, such, uh, such, such double taxing. There, there might well be. So I think, uh, Jason, it might be good for you to speak to Cora as well. <laughs> But Singapore and Hong Kong, I think, have one of the most favorable tax agreements because Hong Kong has 0% tax on dividends and 0% capital gains, and they have very favorable agreements between the two countries. So I'm sure there's a special way to do it that you would not be paying double tax in both countries. Um, so I'll share the details. Um, good. Okay. Any, any other questions? Who are you referring to? Is it uh, Cora? Yes. Have you, do you know Cora? Uh, is it Cora Chuang from C Advisory? Yes, yes, C Advisory is who we work with. Um, otherwise, okay. if, if Panjak, if you have other contacts, um, again, Singapore is a, a hub for doing these types of things, so she's not the only one. Um, we, we've, just like law firms, we've used many different lawyers uh, and we've tried to find people that are just easy to work with. So Cora has been great so far, but again, there's many different providers in Singapore that you can, you can ask. Okay, fantastic. Um, uh, good. I, I, I had one question from my side, so I'm sure you have worked with uh, hundreds of startups and SMEs and you're working with them regular on a regular basis. Let's say there's one particular startup in a batch uh, which works with uh, startups and SMEs and offers their services to the startups and services, uh, to, to SMEs. Is there any possibility we could do some kind of, you know, uh, promotion or marketing collaboration uh, between that startup and you so that uh, this particular startup can 
promote their products and services through your partnership? Is that a possibility? Yeah, so in terms of Sleek, we're always looking for like complementary partners in terms of, right. um, uh, so we have a whole partnership team dedicated to finding, there's different types of partners we look at. One is people that can refer uh, like startups to us. So like Accelerate is a great like that. Um, so we can help them. But at the same time, we have a whole pool of clients that need help in other areas of their business that we don't do. And so that just, team that we have, that is the one that looking at all these different providers, different service partners, and then we are partnering with them when there's a really strategic need and our clients are asking for us for that kind of help. Um, so yes, of course, um, we look at every opportunity. Makes perfect sense. Sounds great, Daniel. Um, great. Anything else? Any, any other question from the team side? Kirill, I know you just joined. Uh, I, I recorded the se session for you, so I'll send it to you. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, then probably you can connect with Daniel separately, Kathleen separately, and get your questions answered. Okay. Perfect. Thank you all for your time. So I'll send a slide deck uh, to Panjak. Uh, there will be um, also, I think, a code which you can use. Um, Fantastic. So that will give you a bit of a discount. And then um, any other questions, you're more than welcome to come one on one and we can talk through your, your plans. But I'm wishing you all you. a good rest of the day. Thanks, Thanks Daniel. Daniel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel.